So, uh, we are now going to carry on with uh, answer seven of the Risha Ankokuron. Securing the peace in the land through establishing the ultimate truth. Uh, you may remember that at the last lecture, which was quite a short one, because we followed it with a presentation about the world peace exposition, we dealt with the seventh question itself, which was posed by the traveler to his host in their discussion on the disastrous state of Japan at that time and the reasons for it. In this most important thesis, which was written by Nichiren Daishonin in 1260 and sent to the most powerful man in Japan, a man called Hojo Tokiyori. There are a total of nine questions, but only eight answers. The reason is, as you may remember, that the ninth question requires no answer because it's an answer in itself. In other words, the traveler who has been through a process of shakabuku by discussion and persuasion with Nichiren Daishonin is in fact finally convinced and therefore answers the question himself. So the host, as you know, in this thesis is Nichiren Daishonin and the traveler is Hojo Tokiyori. Unfortunately, Hojo Tokiyori was not convinced in actuality by this thesis when Nichiren Daishonin sent it to him. If he had been, of course, the history of Japan might have been very different over the past 700 years. Indeed, perhaps it might not have led to the dropping of the atom bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the destruction of the entire country in World War II by aerial bombardment. The seventh question ends with the words as follows. Therefore, one must first of all pray for the safety of the nation and then work to establish the Buddhist law. Now, if you know of any means whereby disasters can be prevented and troubles brought to an end, I would like to hear about it. If only Hojo Tokiyori had really answered in that way, as I say, things and history might have been incredibly different. The Buddhist law would have flourished 700 years ago in Japan. Instead of nearly falling into darkness uh, towards the outset of World War II, when Mr. Toda and Mr. Makiguchi were imprisoned. If only Hojo Tokiori had really talked like that, perhaps uh, the Far East would have never been affected by World War II. And many things would have been different to today. But of course, these sort of if-onlys are only hypothetical, aren't they? And are really of little account because all that has happened in those 700 years is now a matter of history. Hojo Tokuyori did not listen to Nichiren Daishonin. The Buddhist law was not established 700 years ago. So all that is the past. But for us, the important thing is that the message of the Risho Ankokuron is not in the least bit old history. It's not something of the past. Indeed, it lives today as it's never lived before. The governments and people of today should heed the Risho An Kokoron and act by it more importantly than ever before. For today, as I know you understand, it's not Japan that is on the verge of destroying itself as it was in those days in the Middle Ages but the whole world. <clears throat> so the great question is, will the people of the world listen and respect the message of the Risho Ankokuron? And that is our task. No one else is. The message of the Risho Ankokuron is therefore for us, very much so, who live today in this age of chaos in the entire world. And the message is, that we must introduce Buddhism to other people and we must really sow seeds wherever we go. Remembering that every time we do it, 
is, and we persuade someone to practice, it's one more brick in the great castle of world peace. But as Sensei said during European summer course, we must teach the great principles of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism everywhere we go, whether or not people listen to what we have to say, and whether or not they seem likely to practice. And the reason for that is that in no way are we able to judge who will practice and who will not practice. And in any case, even an understanding of the fact that, for example, life is the most precious treasure in the universe and should be respected amongst all else, or that man and his environment are completely inseparable, even an understanding of such great principles as this, or the principle of cause and effect, even an understanding of such a principle will make a profound difference to a person's life whether or not they actually practice Buddhism. Once a person has heard of the law of cause and effect or the fact that life is eternal and the Buddhist teaching on it, they cannot fail that, than begin to think in many cases. And this will partially open their eyes and their minds and deeply affect their actions, even though they may not always realize it. So, in the concept of Kosen Rufa of the world, the support of people who can see something of the greatness of Buddhism through its principles is extremely important, whether or not they ever commit themselves to practice, which is a matter of whether or not their karma is ripe in order to do so. Their influence those who can see the greatness of the principles and think about it and let it affect their lives, even, over a little, even only a little, is of incredible importance uh, from the point of view of the future peace of the world. And together with those others of us who are actually practicing, they will help to tilt the balance of this world towards positive rather than, net than the negative slide which it's going through up to the present time. So to help us win such support is indeed the great purpose of our World Peace Exposition, for example, which will take place next March. It should also be the purpose of our discussion meetings. And I have talked about this a lot recently and indeed written about it in the editorial in the latest UK Express. So having said that as an introduction, Let's now remind ourselves of question seven again, read that through, and then go on to read through the answer. And as it's rather long, I've got two readers this afternoon to share the task. That is. The guest, continuing to speak in a mild manner, replied, One could hardly say that Honen is the only one who disparages sutras and speaks ill of other priests, since you do the same thing yourself. However, it is true that he takes the 637 Mahayana scriptures with their 2,883 volumes of text along with all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and the deities of the heavenly and human worlds and urges people to discard, close, ignore and abandon them. There is no doubt that these four injunctions are his very words. The meaning of the passage is quite clear. But you keep harping on this one little flaw in the jewel and severely slandering him for it. I do not know whether he spoke out of delusion or out of true enlightenment. Between you and Honen, I cannot tell which is wise and which is foolish or determine whose assertions are right and whose are wrong. However, you assert that all the recent disasters are to be traced to the Senchakushu of Honen, speaking quite volubly on that point and elaborating on the meaning of your assertion. assertion. <clears throat> now surely the peace of the world and the stability of the nation are sought by both ruler and subject and desired by all the inhabitants of the country. The nation achieves prosperity through the Buddhist law and the validity of the law is proven by the people who embrace it. If the nation is destroyed and the people are wiped out, then who will continue to pay reverence to the Buddhas? Who will continue to have faith in the law? 
Therefore, one must first of all pray for the safety of the nation and then work to establish the Buddhist law. Now, if you know of any means whereby disasters can be prevented and troubles brought to an end, I would like to hear about it. The host said, There is no doubt that I am the foolish one. I would never dare claim to be wise. However, I would just like to quote a few passages from the scriptures. Concerning the means for ensuring order in the nation, there are numerous passages in both Buddhist and non-Buddhist texts, and it would be difficult to cite them all here. Since taking up the study of Buddhism, however, I have frequently given thought to this matter, and it seems to me that prohibiting those who slander the law and paying respect to monks who follow the correct way is the best way to assure stability within the nation and peace in the world at large. In the Nirvana Sutra we read, the Buddha said, with the exception of one type of person, you may present the teachings to all kinds of persons and they will in all cases greet you with praise. Chunda said, what do you mean when you speak of one type of person? The Buddha replied, I mean the type described in this sutra as violators of the commandments. Chunda spoke again saying, I'm afraid I still do not understand. May I ask you to explain further? The Buddha addressed Chunda saying, by violators of the commandments, I mean the Ichantika. In the case of all other types of persons, you may present the teachings. They will in all cases greet you with praise and you will achieve great rewards. Chunda spoke once more asking, what is the meaning of the term Ichantika? <clears throat> the Buddha said, Chunda, supp suppose there, would be, there should be priests or nuns, laymen or laywomen who speak careless and evil words and slander the true law and that they should go on committing these grave acts without ever showing any inclination to reform or any sign of repentance in their hearts. Persons of this kind, I would say, are following the path of the Ichantika. Again, there may be those who commit the four grave offences or are guilty of the five cardinal sins and who, though aware that they are guilty of serious faults, from the beginning have no trace of fear or contrition in their hearts or if they do, give no outward sign of it. When it comes to the true law, they show no inclination to, estab to establish it and help to protect it over the ages, but rather speak of it with malice and contempt, their words replete with error. Persons of this kind too, I would say, are following the path of the Ichantika. With the exception of this one group of people called Ichantika, however, you may present the teachings to all others and they will in all cases greet you with praise. Elsewhere in the same sutra, the Buddha spoke in these words. When I recall the past, I remember that I was the king of a great state in this continent of Jambudvipa. My name was Senyo. I had the greatest affection and respect for the Mahayana scriptures. My heart was pure and good and had no trace of evil, jealousy or stinginess. Men of devout faith, at that time I cherished the Mahayana teachings in my heart. Once, when I heard the Brahmins slandering these same teachings, I had them put to death on the spot. Men of devout faith, as a result of that action, I was never thereafter in danger of being reborn in hell. In another passage it says, in the past, when the Tathagata was the ruler of a nation and practiced the way of the Bodhisattva, he put to death a number of Brahmins. Again it says, there are three degrees of killings, the lower, middle and upper degrees. The lower degree constitutes the killing of any humble creature, from an ant to any of the various kinds of animals. Only the killing of a Bodhisattva who has deliberately chosen to be born in animal form may be considered an exception. As a result of a killing of the lower degree, one will fall into the realms of hell, hunger or animality and will suffer all the pains appropriate to a killing of the lower degree. Why should this be? Because even the animals and other humble creatures possess the roots of goodness, insignificant though these roots may be. That is why a person who kills such a creature must suffer full retribution for his offence. Killing any person from an ordinary mortal to an, to an anagamin constitutes what is termed the middle degree. As a consequence of such an act of killing, 
one will fall into the realms of hell, hunger or animality and will suffer all the pains appropriate to a killing of the middle degree. The upper degree of killing refers to the killing of a parent, an arhat, a person who has reached the state of pratikya buddha or realization or a bodhisattva who has completed his efforts and will never retrogress. For such a crime, one will fall into the hell of incessant suffering. Men of devout faith, if someone were to kill an Ichantika, that killing would not fall into any of the three categories just mentioned. Men of devout faith, the various Brahmins that I have said were put to death, all of them were in fact Ichantika. In the Nino Sutra we read, the Buddha announced to King Prasanajit, saying, Thus I entrust the protection of my teachings to the ruler of the nation rather than to the monks and nuns. Why do I do so? Because the monks and nuns do not possess the kind of power and authority that the king has. The Nirvana Sutra states, Now I take this true law which is without superior and entrust it to the rulers, the high officials, the prime ministers and the four <coughs> kinds of believers. If anyone should vilify the true law, then the high officials and four kinds of believers should reprimand him and bring him to order. It also states, The Buddha said, Kasho, it is because I was a defender of the true law that I am now able to attain this diamond-like body. Men of devout faith, defenders of the true law, need not observe the five precepts or practice the rules of proper behavior. Rather, they should carry knives and swords, bows and arrows, prongs and lances. Again, the Buddha said, even though there may be those who observe the five precepts, they do not deserve to be called practitioners of the Mahayana. But even if one does not observe the five precepts, if he defends the true law, then he may be called a practitioner of the Mahayana. Defenders of the true law ought to arm themselves with knives and swords, weapons and staves. Even though they carry knives and staves, I would call them men who observe the precepts. The Buddha likewise said, Men of devout faith, in past ages, in this very city of Kushinagara, a Buddha appeared whose name was Kanji Zoyaku Nyorai, or the Buddha Joy Increased. After this Buddha passed away, the true law that he had taught remained in the world for countless millions of years. Finally, only 40 more years were left before the law was due to come to an end. At that time, there was a monk named Kakutoku who observed the precepts. There were many monks at this time who violated the precepts. And when they heard this monk preaching, they all conceived evil designs in their hearts and arming themselves with knives and staves, attacked this teacher of the law. At this time, the ruler of the kingdom was named Utoku. He received reports of what was happening. And in order to defend the law, he went at once to the place where the monk was preaching the law and fought with all his might against the evil monks who did not observe the precepts. As a result, the monk who had been preaching the law was able to escape injury. But the king received so many wounds from the knives and swords, prongs and lances, that there was not a spot on his body the size of a mustard seed that remained unharmed. At this time, the monk Kakutoku praised the king, saying, Splendid, splendid, you, O king, are now a true defender of the true law. In ages to come, this body of yours will surely become a boundless vessel of the law. At that time, the king had already heard the teachings of the law, and he felt great joy in his heart. Thereupon his life came to an end, and he was re reborn in the land of the Buddha, Ashuku. There he became the principal disciple of the Buddha. Moreover, all the military leaders, citizens and associates of the king who had fought beside the king or had rejoiced in his efforts were filled with an unflagging determination to achieve enlightenment. And when they died, all of them were reborn in the land of the Buddha, Ashuku. Later, the monk Kakutoku also died and he too was reborn in the land of the Buddha Ashoku, where he became second among the disciples who received the direct teachings of the Buddha. Thus, if the true law is about to come to an end, this is the way one ought to support and defend it. Kasho, 
The king who lived at that time was I myself, and the monk who preached the law was the Buddha, Kasho. Kasho, those who defend the true law enjoy this kind of boundless reward. As a consequence, I have been able to obtain the various characteristic marks that I possess today to adorn myself with them and to put on the Dharma body that can never be destroyed. Then the Buddha announced to the Bodhisattva Kasho saying, For this reason, lay believers who wish to defend the law should arm themselves with knives and staves and protect it in this manner. Men of devout faith, in the age of confusion and evil after I have passed away, the nation will fall into neglect and disorder. Men will plunder and steal from one another, and the common people will be reduced to starvation. Because of the famine, many men at that time will declare their determination to leave their families and become monks. Men such as these may be called shave pates. When this crowd of shave pates see anyone who is attempting to protect the true law, they will chase after him and drive him away, or perhaps even kill him or do him injury. That is why I now give permission for monks who observe the precepts to associate with and keep company with laymen who bear knives and staves. For even though they carry knives and staves, I would call them men who observe the precepts. But although they may carry knives and staves, they should never use them to take life. The Lotus Sutra says, one who refuses to take faith in this sutra and instead slanders it, will destroy the seeds for becoming a Buddha in this world, and after he dies he will fall into the hell of incessant suffering. The meaning of these passages from the sutras is perfectly clear. What need is there for me to add any further explanation? If we accept the words of the Lotus Sutra, then we must understand that slandering the Mahayana scriptures is more serious than committing the five cardinal sins. Therefore, one who does so is confined in the great fortress of the hell of incessant suffering and cannot hope for release for countless eons. And if we accept the words of the Nirvana Sutra, we must know that even though a person who committed one of the five cardinal sins might be allowed to receive alms, a person who, has, who had slandered the law could never receive them. He who kills so much as an ant will fall into one of the three evil paths. But he who helps to wipe out slander of the law will ascend to the state from which there can be no retrogression. Thus the passage tells us that the monk Kakutoku was reborn as the Buddha Kasho and that King Utoku was reborn as Buddha Shakyamuni. The Lotus and Nirvana Sutras represent the very heart of the doctrines that Shakyamuni preached during the five periods of his teaching life. Their warnings must be viewed with the utmost gravity. Who could fail to heed them? And yet those families who slander the law, those men who forget about the correct way, put more trust than ever in Honen Senshaku Shu and grow blinder than ever in their stupidity. Thus some of them, remembering how their master looked in life, fashion sculptures and paintings of him, while others, putting faith in his perverse teachings, carve woodblocks with which to print his offensive words. These images and writings they scatter about throughout the area within the seas, carrying them beyond the cities and into the countryside until, wherever honour is paid, it is to the practices of this school, and wherever arms are given, it is to the priests of this sect. As a result, we see people cutting off the fingers of the images of Shakyamuni and refashioning them to form the gesture appropriate to Amida, or renovating temples formerly dedicated to Yakushi, the Buddha of the eastern region, and fitting them with statues of Amida, the lord of the western land. Or we find the ceremony of copying the Lotus Sutra, which has been carried out for over 400 years on Mount Hiei, being suspended and the copying of the three Pure Land Sutras substituted in its place. Or the annual lectures on the doctrines of the great teacher Tian Tai being replaced by lectures on the teachings of Shan Tao. Indeed, the slanderous people and their associates are too numerous to count. Are they not destroyers of the Buddha? Are they not destroyers of the law? Are they not destroyers of the priesthood? And all their heretical teachings derived from the Shenshaku Shu. 
Alas, how pitiful that others should turn their backs on the enlightened prohibitions of the Buddha. How tragic that they should heed the grace and delu gross and deluded words of these ignorant monks. If we hope to bring order and tranquility to the world without further delay, we must put an end to these slanders of the law that fill the country. Thank you very much. So, as you see, this is pretty strong stuff. And it's very easy to get entirely the wrong end of the stick. Uh, at the same time, this particular answer to question seven contains an immense amount which is of the greatest possible importance to all of us. And uh, I hope during the remainder of our time here to be able to explain this clearly to you. We'll start now at the beginning of the question again, and I'll ask John to just read uh, the first part or passage that we'll take to study. The host said, There is no doubt that I am the foolish one. I would never dare claim to be wise. However, I would just like to quote a few passages from the scriptures. Here Nichiren Daishonin says, I would never dare claim to be wise. And this may just sound to us like a, a modest statement from a humble man. But in fact, there is a very deep meaning to that short sentence, which is important to us too today. In saying that, Nichiren Daishonin is respecting the fact that the Buddha state exists in all common mortals, including, of course, the traveler or Hojo Tokiori, as he really is. And we need, of course, in our own lives, and we soon discover it if we don't know it now, to recognize the same thing. That everyone we talk to about Buddhism, everyone who perhaps rejects Buddhism, still has the Buddha state in their lives, but is unable to accept it due, due to the state of their karma at that particular time. The important thing Nichiren Daishonin is saying here is, Buddhahood is not exclusive to me. You and you and you all also have the Buddha state within you and the potentiality to become Buddha. And I think you'll agree this is really refreshing compared to many other religious leaders who have placed themselves on a pedestal in one way or another. Throughout his teachings, as you know, Nichiren Daishonin constantly related everything he taught to the groundwork which had been prepared by Shakyamuni Buddha 2,000 years before. He constantly relates his enlightenment to Shakyamuni's enlightenment. And he constantly says, you too can achieve the same state of Buddhahood as was achieved by Shakyamuni and myself. This is so different, isn't it? from the founders of other religions who have based their teachings on dramatic personal visions and mystic messages uh, from some omnipotent power which has therefore been exclusive to themselves and unshareable with anyone else and has there therefore has placed them in a position of superiority to all others who followed them. Nichiren Daishonin was enlightened. We know this from his own story. We know it because we too see ourselves changing our karma as a result of his teachings. He was enlightened naturally. But he gave documentary proof of every single thing that he taught based in a direct line from the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha 2,000 years before. So one often says that Shakyamuni prepared a blueprint from which Nichiren Daishonin extracted the ultimate truth and conveyed it in such a way that we can find it in our own lives. Nichiren Daishonin's method of teaching never involved mysticism or miracles which could spellbind gullible people. He explained everything in the greatest detail, including such events as the occurred on the beach at Tatsunokuchi. After he wrote the Risho Ankokuron and presented it to Hojo Tokiori, he wrote 11 more letters to people in power 
in various fields of society in Japan. In not one of those letters did he talk about visions or mystic prophecies. Even his prophecy of foreign invasion and civil strife, which he said was bound to come if Japan didn't follow the true teachings, was supported by reference to the theory taught by Shakyamuni Buddha of the three calamities and the seven disasters. Everything that he said is explainable by reason and logic. The point being that the ultimate truth, if it is the ultimate truth, does not need to be supported by any magical occurrences. The strange thing is, though, that human beings so much like mystery and magical things they're so fascinated by them that in the history books uh, one finds all sorts of references to Nichiren Daishonin which are completely false. These references being of various magical things that he did such as uh, standing on ships and calming the waves and so on and so forth. Trying to make him out to be a sort of King Canute. Even I believe in the book Shogun which is so popular uh, some of that appears. This is because such things are popular in the human mind. But nevertheless, he never, never used such means. And of course, never should we either resort to stories of mysticism or magical happenings to impress anybody with Buddhism. This is merely playing to sensational and emotional minds. We too, through the Gosho, and through our own actual experience of the power of the practice, can explain through logic and reasoning. But I do emphasize that this means study. And of course, our experiences of actual proof of the power of the practices means that we must practice. Two essential practices for this teaching. I really can't overemphasize that without study, we cannot achieve our own human revolution. Without study, we cannot expect to be able to spread the teachings throughout our country. And without study, we cannot attain Buddhahood. So I'm pleased to see so many people here this afternoon. Study being one of the vital practices which Nichiren Daishonin specifically stated were necessary in order to attain the ultimate goal of our practice. Okay, we'll read on. Concerning the means for ensuring order in the nation, there are numerous passages in both Buddhist and non-Buddhist texts, and it would be difficult to cite them all here. Since taking up the study of Buddhism, however, I have frequently given thought to this matter, and it seems to me that prohibiting those who slander the law and paying respect to monks who follow the correct way is the best way to assure stability within the nation and peace in the world at large. Thank you. This statement, of course, expresses the theme running through the whole of the Risho Anka Quran, doesn't it? That slander of the true law, slander of life, in other words, is the surest way to ruin a nation. So what really is slander of the true law? It's not only slandering the Gohans, slandering those who are practicing. This is the specific meaning of slandering the true law. But there is also a general meaning, which is anything which harms life or causes unhappiness. This is slander of the law in the general sense. And this, of course, is what the whole world is suffering from at the moment. Life itself is the true law, isn't it? nam myo kyo which is the law, is life in all its wondrous workings. Today, wherever you look in the world, there is slander of life. To take a few examples, there are brilliant people involved in technology which pollutes the air and the oceans and the environment that surrounds us. There are powerful nations capable of great cultural development who instead are wasting their energies 
on war against those who are weaker. There are scientists, family men, with wives and children, yet who work feverishly, day in and day out, on weapons of total destruction. And there are businessmen who give to charity with one hand and grab hordes of vital commodities, denying them to the poor and undeveloped countries in order to bring the price high and make great profits from it. The list is endless. Such people are either blind, ignorant, and utterly stupid, or if they are not so, they are nothing else but devils. This is why, as I said earlier, we must teach the great principles of Buddhism wherever we go, whether people will listen or not, whether people we think they will listen or not, and whether or not they actually practice. We must step by step open the eyes of the people everywhere and eradicate slander of life, especially through blindness, ignorance and stupidity. This is our most important task. Okay, we'll read on. In the Nirvana Sutra we read, the Buddha said, with the exception of one type of person, you may present the teachings to all kinds of per persons, and they will in all cases greet you with praise. Chunda said, What do you mean when you speak of one type of person? The Buddha replied, I mean the type described in this sutra as violators of the commandments. Chunda spoke again, saying, I am afraid I still do not understand. May I ask you to explain further? The Buddha addressed Chunda, saying, By violators of the commandments, I mean the Ichantika. In the case of all <coughs> other types of pers persons, you may present the teachings. They will in all cases greet you with praise and you will achieve great rewards. So this paragraph doesn't concern the blind, the ignorant and the stupid, but it concerns the devils in disguise who will not listen to what we say or to what the Buddha taught or what anyone else who's trying to to achieve a peaceful world says but throw the teachings back instead and sometimes even try to, to destroy the movements of those who with their whole hearts desire a peaceful and happy world these people uh, were called in this Gosho as you see Ichantika so this is a Sanskrit word Ichan means faith and Tika means not containing. Ichan, faith, tika, not containing. In other words, Ichan tika means containing no faith or truly evil or containing strong evil desire. The Ichan tika. In this paragraph, Nichiren Daishonin says, all other types of people will greet you with praise and you will achieve great rewards through spreading the true teachings. This is referring to the whole concept of Kosen Rufu in Buddhism. That is to say that there are three groups of people, those who practice, those who sometimes practice or maybe practice another religion, but whatever ha happens support because they understand the greatness of the principles of Buddhism and those whose karma is so thick and crusty that nothing can get through it yet and they do not practice at all. People, in other words, who are totally uh, at the mercy of the negative force of life. And such people include the worst of all, the Ichantika. So these three groups are the concept of Kosen Rufu of the world. And provided the two groups of those who practice and those who support the great principles grows stronger and stronger, then Kosen Rufu can be achieved and the balance of the world rectified. We find this grouping too, of course, at all levels of society, not only in the world itself, also in our own country, in our own town, 
or village and even in our own family. So please don't think that I'm saying a person who can't practice is an Ichantika. Of course not. But the Ichantika are included in that particular category. But the point I want to emphasize today is that nobody can possibly tell what category a person is in because it depends on their state of life and karma. How often does one hear stories of how someone has shakabukud somebody who they never thought in a thousand years would practice and someone who they thought would practice they find to their bitter disappointment does not. We cannot judge and this is why Sensei says spread the teachings wherever we go whether or not people listen to what we say. Speak to all whenever's the chance. So to return for a moment to the Ichantika the violators, those who slander without remorse, those who reject the precepts and indeed spit back in the faces of those who are trying to achieve a better world. There was a good explanation of such people in a book I read the other day. Nothing to do with Buddhism. But this man was describing a person whose name was Dolman who truly was in this category of the Ichantika, he said this, I have known men highly practiced in violence who are not half as evil as their deeds. They are conditioned, bent like twigs beyond straightening. In some, indeed, a key component has been lost so that they can never be otherwise than what they are. But Dolman is different. Dolman knows who he is and what he is and he wants to be just that. He is truly in the old phrase a habitation of evil. So probably if we think of recent history and past history we can see the Dolmans, the Ichantikas, the people who truly uh, in all their actions are subtly uh, introducing influences of evil in all whom they contact. In this paragraph it talks about embracing the commandments. Of course the commandments today only consist of one, one precept uh, which is to receive and embrace the true law and to practice with the ichinen of faith. But also it's clear uh, that a precept really is that the activities of such people who embrace the law with sincerity should never be interfered with. In other places in this paragraph, Nichiren Daishonin says how uh, the teachings will be greeted with praise. This is whether or not people actually practice. Of course, they may not greet them with praise immediately, but through discussion and talk and friendship and growing trust, these principles of Buddhism become clear to them. And whether or not they practice, they begin to respect those who do. And then the paragraph goes on to say that by presenting the teachings, we earn great reward. This, of course, is the benefit of making offerings. So as you know, there are two types of offering. Material offerings, which are essential to provide the financial power for activities, for the establishment of centers, training centers, temples in the future, the printing of publications, the communications, and so on. All this is necessary to present the teachings as Nichiren Daishonin described it. 